You want to move more to the They don't have one. So it's one. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'll tell. I guess we'll just get uh, get started with the program. Uh, we have uh, four speakers. Uh, sorry, four presenters in the next uh, in the next uh, in this session. And I hope you had uh, a good break and uh, maybe won some prizes in the in the quiz. Um, without further delay, I would like to welcome uh, an old friend and also the next speaker, Kesue Kamata. Who will be talking about his experience in doing cybersecurity for 21 years? Kamata, if you're ready, come on stage. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So, thank you very much for coming to today's session. And uh, uh, actually, I, I got a presentation request from Adri, like uh, he will have some very small security session in Kyoto and can you come to over Kyoto and I just say yes. And I didn't expect this is uh, happening in the like la large conference like this or uh, even EPNIC. So as, as my presentation title, uh, I try to review my 21 year cybersecurity career and what I can tell to audience. And also I, I used to attend a lot of the international security conferences a lot. and. Then I realized this is my second APNIC conference attending. And the last one was, I, I just checked website and last one was APNIC 19. And that was in 2005. And that was happening the exact same he place here, Kyoto and the ICC. So anyway, this is my second time to come to APNIC, but I'm going to uh, talk about my, my thoughts about cybersecurity in my recent activities. So initially I introduced myself. Uh, so I've been working in only in cybersecurity for 21 years. I see many of the people working in cybersecurity, but uh, many of them are working together as uh, working for cybersecurity as a part of like a network management or IT management, IT developer or something. I see, even in Japan, in many of the Japanese companies, people working for uh, cybersecurity, but together with cybersecurity, they say other jobs. So uh, I've been working only in cybersecurity in 21 years. And then kind of my important background is I did play a lot of TV games during my teenager days. And that is a very important skill of how to talk to computers. And that is, I, I believe that playing a lot of TV games makes your kids become a very good cybersecurity experts. And then after uh, start working, uh, starting the university, I did learn a lot about IT engineering. It was around the year 2000, and I did like networking and op operating system like Linux or Windows operating system, and setting up servers like VPN, uh, hardware devices, and the window uh, web application uh, coding and those things. I, I learned the IT in while I was a university student. Then after that, I started to work for JP Cert, and I had like eight, eight and a half years of uh, cybersecurity operation experience, initially four years in technical operation and other four years uh, international operations. Then after that, I started working for financial industry, uh, three years in bank and 10 years in financial Zizak Japan, that is uh, uh, Japanese financial institutions, uh, mutual collaboration platform. Uh, basically, people call it uh, information sharing activities. So that this is my background. And so today I, I was thinking what kind of message I should include in my presentation. And then, so I have a lot of opportunities to talk with uh, various different cybersecurity people. Uh, so technical people, non-technical people, corporate managers, bankers, uh, even government, police, regulators, uh, even ministers. So when I, 
talk, mo most of them, they they believe that like, cybersecurity uh, is like changing like every day. New things is coming today, tomorrow, uh, day after tomorrow. So every day, new things is coming. Many of the people uh, believe that. But uh, uh, based on my experience, in 21 years experience, I see the many of the new things, uh, just a mix of the something that was happened in the uh, past 20 years. So that is a... Uh, so many people will confuse if there is a new keyword coming, like a zero trust or cloud, or maybe like a supply chain risk management things coming. They, they, they believe like uh, it is a new concept or a new keyword, but that is actually uh, just a mix of the something happened in the past. So the second item I would mention today is, uh, so for understanding the details of the cybersecurity, especially on the technical side. The fundamentals I got 20 years ago is still very effective and the most important part to keep catching up the latest cybersecurity situation. The third one is uh, so for becoming a good cybersecurity expert, getting the both of the knowledge and experience is uh, very important, but it is hard to get both of, both sides of the uh, knowledge and experience. So I, talk, I have a chance to talk uh, I have a lot of chance to talk with the people who just have knowledge, but they don't and um, they don't really understand because they just only have knowledge and the knowledge is not structured very well. And then the people who just have the experience and don't also don't have the structured knowledge. So the having the both of the knowledge side and experience side is both important, but it is really hard to get both of them. So th this is my today's conclusion, and I will start my presentation. <laughs> Uh, so how cybersecurity changed in this maybe 20 to 30 years? Initially, cybersecurity was started like computer virus and worm. And then the motivation of the cyber attacker was more like a technical interest or maybe technical motivations. And then the, after year 2000, the situation is changing, like our cyber attackers doing the uh, cyber activities for money or sometimes hacktivism or maybe national part, the, some kind of activity as a part of the national security. Uh, so especially the national security thing is uh, uh, becoming a part of the political agenda. It is very complicated and com uh, difficult matter to solve, but the cybersecurity is part of national security today. And also the, we see a lot of the new keyword is coming, maybe IPT or ransomware, malware, a lot of the new keywords are coming uh, every year basis. And also the, so cyber, while cybersecurity is changing, we see a lot of the IT environment has been changing. Like we, we didn't have iPhone maybe 15 years ago, but today everyone has like a smartphone and uh, we can easily access to the Google map from everywhere to identify the location where we are now or uh, the di direction where to go. Uh, so the, we have like cloud, we have the remote working environments. Uh, situation has been also changed. So the cyber attack situation today is more like we hear a lot of like a ransomware, DDoS attack, a web, deface, web defacement, a fraud, malware, vulnerability, zero day. Uh, so those kind of the new, not, not new things, but a lot of the different keywords are coming and going. And then it seems like uh, there are a lot of the marketing keywords also there. So, this is kind of the situation uh, now we should understand. And I've been, after around year 2007, I've been trying to identify what is the uh, uh, best way to grow the cybersecurity experts uh, that who can handle the various different issues. And I found uh, pro do doing the hands-on training uh, is very effective to make people under, more understand the details of the cybersecurity. And here are several findings from my hands-on training, trainer experience. The first one is uh, hands-on training is very effective to people uh, for the students understand cybersecurity. And this, is, this aspect is uh, especially important to verify your knowledge is, uh, uh, your understanding of some knowledge is right or not. So, suppose, for example, if we conduct uh, uh, hand-on training of the PCAP, packet capture analysis training, and give, I give you like a TCP IP uh, session file, 
and you can analyze the file and you can try to answer several questions, but you cannot answer if you don't have the certain uh, proper knowledge of the TCP IP. So you can verify yourself by doing the hands-on uh, training to understand if you are really have a good understanding of the technical details. And also uh, based on my, uh, a lot of different hands-on trainings. I always receive the various different questions. And uh, I found the, most of the questions are coming uh, based, o, based, on, uh, based on the lack of the fundamental of IT knowledge. So fundamental of IT knowledge means like uh, knowledge of the like uh, networking, TCP IP or several protocols, or maybe knowledge of the operating systems like Windows, Linux, and knowledge of the server, how does, uh, for example, web server is working, how the email server is working, that kind of the basic knowledge is really help you to understand the technical details of the cybersecurity. So also the I found the, like a, even if I give like a two days training, maybe one week training, people cannot fully understand everything or during the training time. So it is really taking time to make the people understand the uh, te technical details of the cybersecurity and also it, the IT fundamentals. It's it's really taking time to uh, people understand and uh, people realize what it is. And so and so the doing using your hands, doing the hands-on is much better than listen or read. Uh, I think everyone understands this part. So so next my 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 next question was uh, how to make people uh, how to learn IT fundamentals. So I. When I was a university student, I had a lot of chance to learn uh, IT fundamentals, like set up, setting up the network by myself, or setting up server, setting up the web applications, database, so those things, and I gradually understand things. And uh, I, I realize that it's really important to have the both side of the experience and knowledge to get the good IT fundamentals. And uh, setting up the networks by yourself and setting up servers, applications by your hand uh, is really helpful to learn how it works. And then the, the doing it only once will not help you fully understand everything, but doing it multiple times gradually make you have the better understanding uh, one by one. And uh, when I was a university student, I installed Linux today and the next day I try to do something, but I realize I need to uh, start start install Linux again. And so I did uh, installing Linux again and again and again, and I gradually understand the install process of the Linux or how the hard drive was managed or how the operating system is working. So, the, so th those things are really complicated and even if I explain everything, most of the people cannot understand because just listening is not very effective for people to understand uh, those things. And uh, one of the reasons why the, we need experience is because uh, uh, even if we have the different knowledge, the we don't knowledge cannot be structured uh, if, if just with knowledge. We need to have the certain hands-on experience to structure your knowledge of the IT fundamentals and the cybersecurity understanding of the technical details of some cybersecurity needs IT fundamentals. So the structured cybersecurity knowledge requires the structured IT knowledge, IT fundamentals. And also the for the experience part, so so the if everyone almost everyone is asking me how to make our management convinced to spend more budget for cybersecurity. And they don't really understand until they experience some serious cyber attack incidents. So that is, uh, I think that is true. Once if there's any company or board members understand uh, experience uh, very serious cyber attack, they start taking a lot of effort for the uh, cybersecurity matters. So is it possible to experience the, that kind of the serious cyber attack situation without facing in the real one? It, it is also the very difficult part, but the, once if you ex have ever experienced a serious one, your mindset will be changed how security is important. And most of the board members in large corporation environment completely change their mind to set up the good cybersecurity team. I've been taking a lot of time to talk with uh, like a 
、uh, board members in large、uh, Japanese companies, and some of them have really good understanding why cybersecurity is important. But some of them、uh, tell me the truth that they really don't understand what is cybersecurity, but they Uh, follow the government rule or regulation because、uh, everyone considers cybersecurity is important. But he, sometimes he or she says,、uh, I, don't, I don't really understand, but I just do it because the situation is like that. So, the, making the people understand the situation is、uh, experience really helps. That is、uh, for board members and also even for the technical people, the experience really helps you to understand the、uh, details of the things. And also, the, even if you have ever experienced some serious cyber attack, incident handling, what did you do during the incident handling is another key matter. Did you do just a log analysis or did you do forensic analysis or did you、uh, do the coordination with、uh, maybe organizational external entities? Did you talk to management? Did you manage the cybersecurity team? What layer did you work on during the cyber、uh, attack situation is uh, really a、uh, Another key of the experience for making you understand the, the, the cybersecurity things. So, the, how you get the experience virtually? So, we, we better need more cybersecurity experience without having the real、uh, cyber incident happening. And then the, I, I realized the, one of the shortest way is set up an isolated environment by yourself from the network to servers, operating systems, applications, and then do the cyber attack by yourself by reading some books or something. And then the, do the incident investigation by yourself. And then think what kind of the countermeasures will be needed for the environment. It's kind of the good walkthrough to understand how the things work s and how the cyber attack works, how the incident response can be worked. So, this kind, setting up the, this kind of the training course is very effective for making people realize what they don't understand, what they understand, what they can do, and what they cannot do. So, today's message again, the, because I don't have the much time.、Uh, so, it's a very short presentation. But、uh, in cybersecurity world, new, thing, world, new things are coming.、Uh, but the, most of the things are a mix of the, something we saw in the past, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something. So, every, every time when you see the new things, I recommend you consult to someone who has a lo long experience of the cybersecurity. To get the knowledge and opinion, how do you recognize this issue? So, that, that, that is a very、uh, effective way to understand the new things in a way. And also, the fundament, IT fundamentals I got 20 years ago is still very effective. So, I still keep reading some、uh, IT fundamentals book. And、um, most of the book written around the year 2000 is still very much effective and、uh, very well written. And many of the IT fundamentals b o o k today, recently published, h a s、uh, too much content to、uh, talk about details. So, looking back to the 20 years ago, knowledge h a s still very effective. And I suggest you to talk to some, someone who has like maybe 20 years or 30 years experience to,、uh, and asking them what kind of book do you recommend you still. You still think it is very、uh, useful today. And then the, getting both of the knowledge and experience is important, but it's very hard and it's taking time. I try to grow the people, and it's really、uh, taking at least three years until they have the very good fundamentals. So, the,、uh, this, I think this is my last slide future of the cybersecurity. Uh, so, today I see more and more people are coming into the cybersecurity industry. So, who doesn't have the technical understanding? And、uh, it is getting more difficult to communicate with them. And then, the, so there, there's always a huge gap between the people who h a s a long years of cybersecurity and who doesn't have the、uh, long years of cybersecurity. So, so if, if, While I talk to like a corporate top management people, I cannot use any technical keyword, keyword. Like, even I cannot say like DDoS or malware, ransomware, even that I cannot use it. So, that kind of the,、uh, huge gap are there. And understanding that gap is in, important to realize、uh, what kind of communication、uh, will be needed. 
so the so based on those experiences and the findings i created my own hands-on and tabletop hybrid exercise and it really works well and you can find some details at the apnic blog and you can find uh, you can search like apnic blog keisuke kamata and you will find my entries that's all my session thank you very much thank you uh we have time for one question perhaps does anyone have any any pressing questions or curiosity we have one okay uh hi i'm sai i'm a doctoral student uh, in osaka i was just curious um how relevant do you see security certifications and like come tia upwards um or yeah vis-a-vis -vis, you know just experience like you said yes uh certification is a very uh, so there are many certifications available in the world and the Based on my personal research, there is 500 different cybersecurity certificates uh, available in the world. And then the, some certification is only about knowledge. Some certification requires like a really, really hands-on things. And then the, each of the certification has a good side and bad side. Maybe if you take some certification that requires only knowledge, you should recognize you just get knowledge. You don't have the uh experience yet so you, when you learn some certification things i always recommend you to do some hands-on things uh, together with learning the text book so that that's my answer yeah thank you fair enough thank you all right let's give uh another round of applause for kesuke kamata thank you thank you, thank you very much all right, so from uh, experience sharing about uh, the security um, knowledge and community, we go to a presentation by G, G So Jun from uh, KRCCC, Kisa. And he'll be talking about exploitation of the IE JScript 9 type confusion vulnerability in the fake ETA1 crowd crush report. Probably the longest title of the presentation today. All right, the floor is yours. Let's give him a round of applause. Hello, um, I'm Chi Su Chun, uh, and I'll introduce myself briefly. I have been working on vulnerability analyst team at the Korea Energy Security Agency, and I'm interested in fudging and vulnerability analysis. Actually, I don't have enough time to present, so I will uh, proceed with the presentation quickly, and I will introduce about uh, exploitation of the IAJ script 9 type confusion vulnerability in, in the fake Ethereum crowd crush report. Uh, on October 29th, 2022, a massive crowd gathered in Itaewon, Yongsangu, Seoul to enjoy the Halloween party. Around 10 p.m. that day, a battle leg formed in a narrow alley covering about 200 feet, 200 square feet. Uh, people became entangled and pressed together, leading to a disastrous situation that resulted in approximately uh, 300 casualties. The accident uh, left people in South Korea in a state of tremendous shock and sadness, and the government declared a, a one-week national mourning period. Uh, when people were buried in grief, the, the attackers took advantage of the situation creating malicious documents. Once the accident occurred, uh, government disclosed to the public a revision of the uh, response progress uh, report on the Itaewon crowd crush on its website, bulletin board on October 31st. Uh, and the revision report was Hangul file, but the Hangul file was reused in the form of a malicious word document, which contained vulnerabilities and was also found on October 31st. In the process of analyzing the mal malicious document, it was discovered that um, discovered that uh, the document had a zero day. Uh, Vulnerability CV 2022-41128 that no Microsoft patch existed. In response, Microsoft released an official update on patch Tuesday, November 2022 that included a patch, uh, 
a patch for for the vulnerability. Uh, oh, sorry. The attack process. Uh, attacker send a phishing email which contains a word file to the victim in the first stage. Uh, when the victim opens the word file, they assess the URL that the attacker uh, has changed through remote temple injection. As a result, they connect to the first attacker server and download a malicious file. In the file, in in the second stage, by the CV to uh, 2017 uh, vulnerability, the victim assess attacker's URL in the active file and connects to the second attacker server. As a result, they download a HTML file. Uh, in the third stage, uh, CV2022-41128 vulnerability occurs in the process of rendering the downloaded HTML in a Word file. Uh, when rendering HTML in the Word file, Internet Explorer's JavaScript 9 engine is executed. By exploiting the fact that uh, Internet Explorer's JScript 9 engine executes when rendering HTML in Word. An attacker can trigger a type confusion vulnerability within uh, the JScript 9 engine and infect malicious code. Uh, stage one, remote, in, uh, remote temple injection is a cyber attack type that leads the victim to download a malicious payload by abusing the normal functionality of setting remote templates in micro MS Office documents, such as Word and or PowerPoint. Uh, and for a Word file, the settings XML relationships file located in the real software of a Word folder for a remote template. Uh, attackers modify the target tag in the XML file leading the victim to assess the website set up by the, the attacker. The malicious document was set to uh, download the malicious artifact files instead of templates uh, from msoffice.com and uh, schemas of an XML format.org, which were disguised as a normal domains. Uh, CV2017-0199 uh, vulnerability is a remote code execution vulnerability caused by the OBJ8 link in a Microsoft Word uh, RTF document. When the victim opens the RTF file containing OBJ8 link, uh, the, the OBJ8 link downloads uh, the file using URL moniker com object. URL moniker com object creates a URL and tries to connect to uh, a network using the moniker class provided by operating system. Uh, we could see an OL link connecting to uh, msoffice.com in the actual downloaded RTF document. And CV2022-41128 explicit code was downloaded from the link. In third stage, CV2022-41128 vulnerability is triggered when the downloaded uh, HTML is executed. As I explained before, in a Word file, uh, Internet Explorer's JScript 9 engine is activated to render HTML. Uh, to improve performance, uh, a JIT compiler is embedded in the J JavaScript engine, such as Chrome V8 and uh, uh, Firefox Spider Monkey, and also Internet Explorer JScript 9. A JIT compiler enhances code reuse efficiency by caching frequently used, used code and compiling it in real time. Uh, here, the JIT compiler triggers a type confusion vulnerability during the, the optimization process. As we can see the POC code, it first creates variables of int32 array and object types. Uh, following that in the boom function, uh, it repeatedly assigns the int32 array type vari variable D to the variable Q for more than a hundred thousand iterations with false as the argument. Uh, as a result, the JIT compiler believes uh, the changed uh, object type is still an integer and attempts to save the data value. Uh, but actually, it saves the data value to object type, uh, not integer type. So it becomes possible to write uh, a value into a specific memory address. In the push code uh, execution results on the right, uh, we can see an assess violation uh, triggered by attackers as they set up 
to write the value they want EAX to their specified memory address, ABX. Uh, this shows how write what where condition is set up. Uh, next, let's take a look at uh, the root cause analysis on CV 224128 uh, and the exploit process. Uh, root cause analysis, the, the function global opt optore source uh, contains the function uh, global optimization uh, should expect a conventional array index value, which is the root cause function for the vulnerability. Uh, before the patch, if the the execution result of the function global opt should expect conventional array index is false. It accessed the function opt array source uh, without type, ver type verification. Uh, since the function global opt should expect conventional array. Ah, oh, sorry. Ah, <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry for. The presentation. Uh, let's let's keep the presentation. Uh, before the JScript nine DLL patch was applied, when the function global opt should should expect conventional array index value returns zero, we can see that the code flow process proceeds directly to a return code block. By passing the type checking process, uh, pros by uh, by passing the type checking process. Uh, we compared the module before and after patch and checked a branching statement was added with MSRC Microsoft Security Response Center function. The execution result of patch it function if the result value is zero. This function branches to should expect conventional array index value. And if not, uh, it branches to the type checking function. Uh, while the MSRC function is not publicly uh, disclosed, uh, it is presumed to be an internally uh, developed function by the MSRC to resolve the, the issue of the vulnerability. And exploit strategy. Uh, I want to point out one thing before moving on to exploit strategy. Uh, the exploit code was shared by Clement Leskny of Google Threat Analysis Group. And for an in-depth analysis, I referred to Google Project Zero's analysis report. Then uh, I will explain the, the exploit strategy. Exploit strategy consists of four steps. Uh, first, grant read-write memory by overriding the length of uh, array object and leak JSC9 DLA VF pointer. And second, corrupt corrupt uh, additional array object to point a data view objects buffer to achieve arbitrary memory read write. Third, uh, create a fake string object and a fake VF table using arbitrary memory read write. Lastly, call the virtual protect function and execute a shellcode use, using fake VF table. Uh, as I explained in the POC code, despite assigning an object to the variable Q, it is still recognized as int32 array due to type confusion. Consequently, uh, it becomes possible to write arbitrary values to B52 through the Q variable. Q now uh, points to the header of the B52 array by setting fields such as array length and array actual length and buffer length within the array header. Or, array header. Uh, the, the attacker extends the size of B52 to 1x uh, uh, in 1FFF FF in hex, so lar large size. Uh, originally, the size of B52 was uh, 20 in hex, but it is changed to uh, 1FFF FF in hex. Uh, therefore, the attacker can assess memory of other arrays like B53 uh, or B54, later using B52 by N array. Uh, within the header of the B52 array, there is uh, the address of JScript 9 js uh, JavaScript native in array VF table. This address can be extracted, this, this Information can, uh, this information is important for finding the image base of JScript 9D 
DLL, which will be used during the later steps of the exploit. Here, the values stored in Q0 and Q1 are 64-bit VF table pointers. However, due to type confusion, they are recognized as int32 array, enabling assess in 32-bit each. Uh, therefore, by dividing the var variable into Q0 and Q1 and linking them, uh, attackers can get the value for 64 bits. And the second step is to corrupt the, the array object additionally to point the data, value, data view objects buffer to get arbitrary read and write. To achieve this, uh, the first thing to do is to create data view object. As seen in the code, uh, a 16 bit byte array buffer is allocated and a data view object is created, which is then assigned to be 53 by zero. As a result, as we can see in the structure, the, the address of uh, data view object is stored in the data area of the B53 array object contents. And the second thing to do is to copy and override B53 array contents pointer to B54 array contents pointer. Due to the corrosion of the array length, uh, it is possible to assess both uh, B53 and B54's array contents pointer with B52. As a result, B53 and B54 uh, both point to the same contents and just like B53, uh, point to data view object in the data area. Uh, the third thing to do is to override uh, data view object address to B54's uh, array contents pointer. As we can see in the code, attacker lists the, the address of uh, the data view object by reading the value of B54 by zero and by one, a subtract four from them, and assign the resulting values to B52, 80, 81, 82, and 83 thus overriding B54's uh, array content pointer. The reason for corrupting the B54 array like this uh, is to abuse data view object uh, data through uh, the B54 array, enabling arbitrary memory read-write. Read uh, the fourth uh, is to uh, arbitrary read and write memory using B54 array. Uh, through the third process, uh, B54 by zero points to data view object start address minus four and corrupts data view object data through B54 seven and eight arrays, which enables arbitrary memory read and write. Uh, attacker set uh, function read four and function write four as in the code on the left to enable arbitrary read and write. And next, uh, attacker can uh, attacker create a fake literal string object for arbitrary code execution. Uh, attacker needs dummy literal string, compound string, and shellcode string. The dummy literal string will be used for uh, copying function pointers and obtaining type pointer later. Uh, the compound string allocates 2,900 bytes of memory space with uh, 64 zeros, which will be used as arguments for the virtual protect function in the future. The shellcode string will be used for executing malicious code. Uh, to create fake object, the first thing to do is to allocate string objects to B53 array. In this process, the address of a uh, literal string object is overridden to B53 uh, by one, which is later used to create fake object. In the structure of a uh, literal string object, values are saved in uh, the following order of VF table, type pointer, size, and buffer pointer. The second thing to do is to override B56 array data buffer address to literal string object a brief table, uh, as we can see in the code on the left, uh, attacker, uh, attacker assess with uh, B52 by 32 plus 
32 plus uh, 36 and B52, 33, and with the address of a literal string object. Later, uh, values of B52, uh, 176 to plus 24 and B52, uh, 177 uh, are written to the the address of literal string object that uh, were read before. Uh, B52 uh, by B176 uh, and B52, 177 uh, refers to B56 arrays data buffer address. Uh, these are later used to create fake VF table, uh, which is created in uh, B56 buffer. Uh, to create the fake object, uh, attacker uh, reads the VF table and literal string uh, type from uh, literal string object and compound string length and uh, string buffer pointer values from uh, compound string object. Also, shellcode string object buffer pointer is copied, uh, copied to be fifty three, us, be fifty three one after a setting like this. Uh, it is possible to call a specific function by referring to fake VF table through uh, b fifty three one. In order not to break the, the execution flow, uh, two proper functions uh, need to copy, copy it from original literal string VF table. Here, uh, the two functions, JS Java, Java, JavaScript string get a property reference and JS health callback can allow a breakpoints are copied. Later, using the function uh, JavaScript string uh, get original string reference, the virtual protect function and shellcode are ex executed. The virtual protect function is a win window API function that is used to modify uh, the protection attributes of a specified region of memory. It allows to control and change the, the access permissions of a memory region, such as whether it can be read, written to, were executed. Uh, since the, the ASL protection technique is applied, JScript 9 DLS uh, address, uh, which was leaked from uh, exploit step one, is required to find the virtual protect function. So the first thing to do is to find a specific P header value to uh, search the, the image base address of JScript 9 DLS. Uh, the second thing to do is to find the imported uh, function of kernel 32 DLA by parsing the import table of JScript 9 DLA. Uh, then search the base the base uh, uh, the base address of uh, kernel 32 DLA from arbitrary kernel 32 function. Lastly, find the the address of the virtual protect function by parsing uh, the export table of kernel 32 DLA. Uh, the attacker writes the virtual protect function address and the uh, uh, shortcut address in the fake VF table uh, at offset to two uh, C eight in hex uh, it's a JavaScript string get original uh, string uh, string reference functions offset of original VF table uh, to enable the the execution of both the virtual protect function and the shortcut. Uh, when the train function of B53 one X uh, by one is executed, uh, it references the fake object and fake VF table leading to the, the execution of the virtual protect function and shellcode. You have one minute. Yeah, <laughs> last two takeaways. Um, uh, a watering hole, a spear phishing email, and similar tactics are commonly used 
in ap.tax and are highly effective at misleading users even though uh, support for internet explorer has ended applications like word and powerpoint still rely on some of its models making them vulnerable to exploitation despite uh, the end of iex support ap.tax not only used non uh, vulnerabilities but also zero day vulnerabilities that haven't been patched uh, making uh, users vulnerable even uh, with a regular security updates. Therefore, uh, users need to pay extra attention and it is important not to open uh, documents with unreliable source and uh, uh, check send sender's domain, uh, rec reconfirming whether they are trustworthy or not. Uh, if a document pr prompts uh, uh, the, the execution of macros or triggers security warnings, uh, users should be suspicious of the situation and stop the act of uh, opening the document. Lastly, it's important to keep antivirus software up to date, uh, perform regular scans, and uh, ensure that the opening uh, operating system remains secure through uh, regular security updates to prevent vulnerabilities. And okay, so uh, this is end of my presentation. I'm so sorry for the first presentation that I didn't check the. The, the the presentation. I'm so sorry. Uh, if you have any question regarding uh, the presentation, uh, please send an email or uh, question. Question? Any question? <laughs> All right. Let's give a round of applause for the presentation. We are uh, we are running a little bit uh, behind time, so maybe you can either send a question or find him. Uh, to ask a question. I'm glad that he did all the hard work for us. And uh, let's give him one more round of applause. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, we are now with uh, our third uh, presenter for the session. Uh, it's uh, Charles Lim. Uh, he will be sharing about developing cybersecurity incident response capability in the higher education sector in Indonesia. So let's give him a round of applause. Yes, yes. I need to turn it on. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Pa Adli. I often call him Pa Adli uh, for the opportunity. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Charles Lim. I'm going to speak to you about uh, how we develop a cybersecurity incident response team in uh, higher education Indonesia. Uh, the uh, logo is actually Akat CERT, and um, we also used to have uh, Kamata San and also uh, Pa Adli uh, back in 2011 when we started this uh, community. So let's uh, go and talk about this. Uh, uh, cybersecurity incident response team. Okay, just a little bit about me. Uh, I finished my doctor degree in 2019 uh, in the area of malware. And uh, my research uh, is actually in malware and I get um, a 2022 award from ECIF Asia, the APNIC Foundation. Uh, and uh, we also have a very beautiful dashboard to actually uh, display all our uh, HoneyNet uh, threat data. Yeah, and you can actually go online to see that uh, public.cscisec.org. Um, and uh, other than that, we also do a lot of research in uh, other um, like intrusion detection, vulnerability analysis, uh, forensic and cloud security. Uh, other than um, uh, Akat CSERT, I also Actually, not chapter lead anymore. Uh, Pak Kalpin is now uh, our chapter lead. Uh, he's sitting in the uh, audience. Um, and also, I'm involved in Asociasi Forensic uh, in Indonesia. Of course, uh, in my uh, 
uh, daytime, I usually teach uh, master degree and bachelor degree. Okay, so the agenda is actually uh, to talk about what are the challenges, right, uh, in the higher education institution. Uh, and then, of course, talking about um, the CSERT uh, services that we need in Indonesia. And of course, also, uh, what are the components that we need also to establish that? Okay, and then we talk about strategy, the journey, and some case study. Okay, uh, the CSET philosophy that I learned from the head of Akad CSET, yeah, uh, uh, actually, Prof. Heko is, uh, used to be the head of uh, ID Sirti, uh, Indonesian um, CERT in Indonesia, yeah. Uh, the first is actually egalitarian, uh, egalitarian yeah, meaning that uh, we have to be uh, exclusive, something like, uh, you know, to also inclusive in the, at the same time, and also trust, right? Building this uh, trust among all the CSET and also uh, non-bureaucratic. Um, sometimes we also uh, establish CSET using our own institution, uh, but we usually, you know, try to ask them not to use their own university name, uh, but use some kind of naming that uh, that easily we can coordinate together. So currently, we have some challenges. Uh, even though uh, Indonesia just published a nice national cybersecurity strategy, uh, it's not yet uh, complete by its own, uh, and then also the framework is not yet. Uh, completed. Uh, the second thing is uh, the awareness uh, of cybersecurity is very low and also preparedness is also very low. So that's one of the biggest challenges in Indonesia. Uh, and also, we also have, uh, you know, recently, uh, the last two, three years, uh, highly uh, exposed uh, many education with uh, ransomware. Uh, and we know that uh, vulnerability has also become an issue uh, to many, many institutions, uh, especially the zero-day run, right? And then the other thing is the limit, limited capacity and capability to detect and respond. Yeah, so we have a low uh, capacity in terms of human, uh, and then also we have uh, the capability itself have to be uh, elevated to the, the level of uh, what we actually expect. So these are the common services uh, you may want to see, actually common yeah, that I display here for all of us to see that uh, we can develop over the time, uh, you know, starting from management perspective, vulnerability, uh, situational awareness, and then of course, uh, training, you know, and including workshops, and of course, um, um, how you can actually create awareness to the public. Now, uh, some of the key components that I think we need to develop over the time uh, in Indonesia is, uh, first of all, uh, create a plan, right? I think we all know that uh, if you uh, fail to plan, you actually plan to fail, right? Uh, so we have to start with planning and we need to develop some uh, capability uh, for the team, uh, including uh, each of the university uh, with the relevant technology. And at, uh, at the end, uh, since we are also talking about resiliency, right, uh, because of this ransomware, we need to be able to uh, recover from any disaster that possible. Okay, uh, over the years, uh, the strategy of we are thinking is actually we need to have a yearly national and international conference to drive the change. Yeah, uh, this include, you know, sharing policy, break plastics, uh, collaboration, and then of course, yearly national drill tests. I think uh, earlier, uh, uh, the Kisa Korean yeah, was talking about the national drill test too. Uh, and then of course, uh, training and coaching. I think uh, training alone will not uh, do. So we need some kind of coaching and personal mentoring. Yeah, so that we can develop uh, quality and uh, specific uh, leaders that will actually coach and uh, lead others as well. And of course, finally, uh, it's about threat sharing, right? 
So how do we build the community then? Okay. So uh, this is the way we actually approach. Uh, we have two government institution that actually have uh, actually understand our uh, vision and mission. Number one is actually on the uh, left hand side, the Ministry of Education. Uh, we have uh, 4,500 uh, higher education. Uh, among 4,500, we have 1,500 that have IT uh, curriculum in their uh, education. So that's the challenge. Okay. Uh, and then we also have a, a cybersecurity agency. Uh, we call this as National Cyber and Crypto Agency, BSSN, or Badan Cyber and Sandi Negara. So we have been collaborating with them uh, since 2018. Okay, so this has been uh, done over the years. And so our community actually want to establish many CSERT in higher education. Okay, so we have this uh, triangle that we want to establish uh, building trust among the community. Now, uh, the Indonesian way. So how do we do that? Well, we have the uh, ministry that we need to build trust. Uh, we also uh, need to build trust among the education. And uh, note that, you know, me coming from one uh, institution, education, coming to another intuition, they may say, hey, you are my competitors, right? And so <laughs> it's very difficult to establish trust. So we need to take off our, you know, university clothing and we have to wear this ACAD C-cert, Academy C-cert, to actually talk to them and building trust. So that's the approach that we want to actually do uh, while we get the support from the Badan Cyber and also Ministry of Education. So here is our journey to build the human uh, capability. So uh, this is what we envision uh, uh, step by step or roadmap, I can say. Yeah, the first is uh, to create awareness. Uh, here we have a seminar, workshop, tutorial, and most of the things maybe we can actually talk about policy, risk, knowledge, right? As you probably already know, uh, competency is actually uh, have three components. We have knowledge, skill, and abilities. So here we talk about uh, knowledge. And learn is actually the next step, uh, next step uh, where we have a training, mentoring, cyber range, right? Uh, where we practice uh, blue team and red team together and, you know, uh, competition. Uh, this raise another level of, you know, uh, maybe also pride, yeah? So that they can uh, compete to each other. And here we have uh, maybe certification, uh, planning, and skills uh, are involved. And then at the next stage, you can also call this as a maturity level as we go, right? Uh, and then we perform where we actually monitor and respond. So we teach them how to monitor their own infrastructure, uh, their own application, their services, and also do cyber drills on a national scale, right? And here we have... Uh, you know, maybe different vendors involved uh, technology-wise, and we need to manage them and then also uh, raise the ability. Uh, finally, we want to achieve. This is what we want to achieve, right? Uh, we want somebody who already being trained, uh, you know, knowledge, skill, and ability. They are able to actually analyze and share their analysis to others. And of course, we need KPI, key performance indicator, to actually measure uh, their improvement, right? Uh, maybe some kind of uh, competency matrix, yeah, uh, regarding of uh, level. And then, of course, finally, if we have some government compliance, we have to comply with. Here, we have a certification, maturity, and improvement is matters. Okay, so, so what about the platform, right? So the platform that we think about is actually in this area. We have infrastructure, learning management system, uh, training modules, collaboration, certification. Uh, you know, this is not just uh, certification for a particular knowledge, but it's also a certification of, I, I will call it as, um, you know, achievement. Yeah, if, you, if you already uh, have some knowledge, but you need to able to actually handle incident. Yeah, and we are going to measure the number of hours that you actually handle incident, number of cases, 
and we summarize that as we call it as certification of achievement. Let's say at the end of the year, uh, we will release a you know, certificate of achievement of maybe you know, 40 year hours or 50 hours, you know, like, like a flying time. Right? So something like that, okay? And then we improve from that, right? And of course, at the end of the day, uh, integration of tools and security is important. Now, here is the key, right? Uh, operationally, uh, Prof. Echo, as the head of Akad CSET, uh, we have the administration in Bandung, uh, but the response center is actually in Jakarta. So we set up a very small so-called security operation center. Uh, you know, it's just uh, four monitors and it may be simple, uh, two monitors in front that we can actually monitor uh, uh, incident and then, uh, uh, you know, ask this uh, lecturer that we train to be involved in incident response. Uh, at the first stage, maybe we just uh, ask them to just notify, right? If there is an incident, oh, uh, certain website has been infected with malware. Uh, we got report maybe from BSSN. We just uh, let the other party know. And then uh, when we see that uh, this is already cleaned up, and uh, we just close the case. So something uh, very simple in the beginning, right? And then we go on from there. Okay, so uh, the other thing that we also uh, have created, yeah, and already successful this year, is what we call the International Conference on uh, Cybersecurity. This is where academicians come in together, publish their papers, uh, so that we have a place where we can have a share, sharing of knowledge, right, a publication. And so we do that. And uh, on the left, you can see the head of the BSSN. Uh, is uh, already officially endorsed this. And so this is the first international conference in cybersecurity in Indonesia. So uh, we progress this uh, as we go, but uh, we are glad that uh, this has been successful and uh, a lot of the students and also lecturer has been publishing in this uh, international conference. Okay, now uh, let's talk about, uh, what about the members meetings, right? And any organization, we always have members meetings. So we did that uh, in 2022. Uh, uh, Kamatasan and also um, Padli uh, was live and giving us some advice and also speaking on uh, various uh, topics, right? Uh, so this is the seminar we call this as uh, Mushawara Nasional, which is actually uh, a national meetup, right? Uh, so that to declare uh, the first, uh, I would call the hat that replaced the old uh, hat that actually passed away uh, in 2021. Now, uh, here is some uh, case study that uh, we do. Uh, there are two case study. One is actually in Universitas Nusa Mandiri, right? Uh, they already established a CSET, uh, but they need a workshop. So we go in. Uh, the way we actually, uh, this is the uh, Nusa Mandiri CSET launch, right? Uh, and you can see uh, our, our uniform is actually orange color on the right-hand side. Yeah. And uh, just beside Pak Solikin, that uh, the person on the right-hand side is our uh, person in charge of BSSN, uh, handling over the uh, certification from uh, BSSN. Okay, and uh, this is the website that they already established. There is a RFC, as always, uh, 2350, uh, to declare you know, the, the manners and everything, uh, how the CSET is established. And uh, we uh, also deliver the first workshop. Now, the problem with, I, as I mentioned, the awareness of cybersecurity is very low. So what we do is we use, uh, a, a one-day workshop. So our research assistant, uh, they are present uh, with us. Uh, they deliver uh, a six-hour workshop. Yeah, this is live on site. Uh, three hours, we ask them to install honeypots, right? Uh, just a very simple uh, Linux command uh, using a virtual machine, Docker. So they learn how to use uh, Linux command and then how to install and to look at their own honeypots that get attacked by the attacker. Once they actually get that running uh, on the uh, uh, afternoon session, we actually have 
um, uh, what we call understanding the threats. You know, when they already successfully install honeypot, they now know, okay, the honeypot get attacked, but what do we want to know, right? So we we get those data and then we teach them how to analyze data. Then they know, oh, okay, now I understand how, uh, let's say, SSH got attacked or our email got attacked. And so the understanding now uh, be able to actually go to the next level. Three minutes, Pat Charles. Yes, thank you very much for reminding. Yeah, so this is just a few slides just to uh, show you uh, the activity. And uh, so... Uh, our next case is actually Universitas Buana Perjuangan Kerawang. Uh, this is another university that we also uh, visited. Yeah, uh, we did a very similar thing. They have a launching for the CSET. Yeah, before we do that, so it's always like uh, when they establish the CSET, they have uh, you know nobody teach them how to do incident response. But the first thing we do is actually get them to aware what is cyber attack, right? What are the threats? Uh, how do we understand them? So it's a very simple uh, understanding of cyber attack. Uh, these are the uh, website, uh, Universitas Buana Perjuangan Kerawang. Yeah, it's about uh, uh, two, three hours yeah, from uh, Jakarta. Yeah, and uh, so these are the uh, you know the you know very similar to this uh, room. Yeah, it's uh, quite big, and uh, they declare that they uh, they establish the CSET. And you know this is the workshop that we actually uh, teach them, you know, how to uh, run honeypots and then also uh, get awareness, right? Uh, and uh, get the first hand, uh, hands-on, uh, you know, real attack data. Uh, and then after that, of course, we uh, take a picture together to show that okay, uh, from now on, you get some uh, support from us, right? If you have any questions, so uh, we can answer questions and help you to understand better. So that's the first stage that we already do. Of course, uh, we'll share more as we go, uh, uh, you know, uh, handling more uh, university. Our target uh, this year is to get 1,000 CSERT uh, so that uh, we can train more and uh, hopefully uh, get their capability up to the next level. Yeah, this is just... Uh, official uh, handing over the uh, the souvenir, yeah. Okay, so in summary, uh, basically, developing community is all about developing trust. Uh, it's not easy. You need uh, patience. You need uh, a lot of communications, just like <laughs> Kamata Sunset, you know. Communication actually matters. You need to uh, talk to them, uh, understand them. Uh, developing trust also uh, we need to uh, uh, pay attention on, I will call it, uh, you know, uh, ABGC, Academic, Business, Government, and Community. And, you know, usually the largest challenge is, uh, you know, when you develop this trust with the uh, university and the government. And finally, developing people is, I think, the key ingredient in any uh, CSET, you know, organization development. So I hope uh, with this, uh, uh, everybody can understand uh, what we have gone through, uh, what are the challenges, and I hope you can learn something from what I talk about today. I think that's all. Uh, uh, back to you, uh, Adli. Thank you very much, Pat Charles. Let's give him a round of applause. And uh, thank you for the hard work. Now, I know some of you may have questions for him, uh, but I'm conscious that we have an event. We have a session right after this, this one. So let's get the last presentation uh, through and if we have time we can have questions for both of the presentations so without further ado i'd like to invite uh yasunari momoi and shigenori take san to present on building cybersecurity resiliency communication and collaboration um the floor is yours let's give them a round of applause okay uh, okay uh can thank you thank you for coming this time uh, uh, here's uh, this session agenda. Uh, I will talk about. Hmm? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I will talk about the first half, and then he will talk about his recent activities. Uh, let's introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Momo from IIJ, 
Uh, IIJ is one of the oldest internet service provider in Japan. And uh, uh, well, that's my, my uh, skills. And uh, <laughs> I, I like eating local foods. <laughs> and uh, as, as we all know, uh, Kyoto, the ancient capital in Japan of Japan is famous for its uh, tra tra traditional Japanese cuisine, but uh, it is also famous among Japanese people for ramen noodles. <laughs> if you would like to try some Japanese B-class uh, gourmet ramen noodles, uh, please ask your Japanese friend for their recommendations. And uh, I love heavy metal music. <laughs> and uh, I have two cats. And next. Hey. Okay. It's okay. Hey, yes. Uh, I'm Shigenori Takei from the NTT Technocross Corporation. And uh, I have some certification uh, CSSP, CCSP, and the NTT group certified and a security principal. And uh, I am uh, also Momoe san, uh, in, uh, a member of the uh, ISOGJ. And, uh, but I'm the best director and uh, working group six leader. Yeah, and uh, Ara Crocs and uh, Chiroru Choco Kinakomuchi. Yeah, what is the Chiroru Choco Kinakomuchi? Yes, that, like this. Okay, you go back to Momo san Go ahead. Okay, let's start. Uh, first, uh, I'll talk about the kind of tech communities in Japan. Uh, uh, there are many different types of communities, and I want to introduce today is uh, one of Japan's uh, grassroots communities, the Tech Study Meeting, and we call uh, ITK Benkyokai. Uh, this this type of meeting uh, generally has uh, these characteristics. Uh, one is a date and time. Uh, most study meetings are held after work on weekdays or on weekends. Uh, this, this is avoid over, overlap with uh, work or classes of those who want to attend. And another one is free. Uh, attending uh, ordinary tech seminar usually costs uh, 100 dollars or more, but uh, study meetings uh, not. Most study meetings have a very low fee or zero. Hmm. Uh, the study meeting is said to have been started around 1994 uh, by the Japan Unix Society. Uh, perhaps because of this, various people have held tech meetings in various places. And uh, I have also assist, assisted in, in organizing them and have hosted them myself. And then uh, around two, 2006, uh, the study meeting boom occurred in Japan. Uh, many tech communities were formed at this time, and some security-related communities were also established at, at this time. Mm, I, I think it is an um, uh, inheritance or a strong influence of the internet culture. Uh, almost hackers and otaku geeks uh, enjoy talking about their favorite tech, uh, favorite tech talk, tech themselves. Uh, they are enjoying, enjoying it. Uh, a, a screenshot of bottom of the screen. Uh, this is calendar with a schedule of tech study meetings. Uh, this calendar was also maintained by volunteers at this time. Uh, this is from uh, two, 2010, June. And you can see that study meetings uh, were held every, every day. Well, uh, I remember that more than half of them were held around Tokyo. Okay, let me talk about ISOGJ. Uh, ISOGJ is an information security operation provider group in Japan, group Japan. 
and Isonj is a professional community and it aims to gather security operation providers and expand the whole security service business and exchange information and techniques between uh, re reliable professionals and improve the quality of security service each other and enlighten users. Mm. Um, we are a part of JNSA, uh, Japan Network Security Association. Uh, each member company is needed to belong to JNSA and each company pays an annual fees to JNSA. But uh, all ISOGJ members are volunteers. Many of our members and engineers, uh, many of our members are engineers with an otak geek mind. <laughs> Almost all members are willing to join in lengthy discussion even after working hours. <laughs> And some, some members takes, take a day off to attend the long discussion. Mm, but I, <laughs> I don't know if this is a good thing or not. <laughs> and well, anyway, man, it is a fun community of people with that kind of mindset. And next. Oh, here's our mission. Please read it our way. And it's overview. Please read our website too. And we we have now uh, sixty three membership organizations. And there's activities. Uh, now uh, ISOGJ has seven or eight working groups, uh, task forces, and projects. And uh, let's skip skip it. <laughs> uh, the security operation technology working group, WZ, uh, has uh, the main purpose of the technical working group is to get along with each other. Uh, we hold the meetings about once a month, maybe. Uh, we call this seminar part, this seminar, seminar part, uh, to a sub part, and this this part we call main part. <laughs> two pictures above our photos of uh, oh sorry, <laughs> two pictures above our photos of sub part, <laughs> and two pictures below our photos of main part. We call them so. <laughs> oh, back to introduce working groups. Uh, and the, the low research of WZ is discussed about around the law and systems uh, about around security of operation business. And they release some documents uh, about information security laws in Japan. And the WZ4 is a working group is in charge of planning events and publication and public creation. And next. <laughs> yes. Uh, here's here's my my uh, our working group and uh, working group six in the name is the security operations chaos working group and why the working group six is working lock uh, in japanese lock pronouncing the lock no six <laughs> six is in japan six is pronounced as rock so we called uh, we are the working group lock and uh but we discuss a bit seriously the any issues on, on the security operation, the chaos, and uh, taking an acronym SOC. So we named the security operation chaos working group. Okay. Uh, here, the past uh, ISOGJ publications uh, 2008 to the 2013. Uh, 2013 is uh, one book uh, just uh, published. And the next, uh, here is the uh, working group one. Working group one is uh, uh, collaborate with uh, OWASP Japan. And here the uh, about uh, um, pen test and the web application by vulnerability assessment. 
And uh, last year, uh, guidelines for the testing for the graph QA and uh, uh, security in agile software de development. Uh, if you are uh, interested uh, in the uh, web application or developing, uh, please uh, download and read uh, these documents. Uh, but these <laughs> publications are all in, uh, written in Japanese. Uh, very sorry, but uh, most of SOC and CSAT members in Japan uh, prefer the uh, Japanese readings. And the next, uh, building a security team. Uh, ISOGJ is a community of, uh, for the security option providers, and uh, each company provides a service for the customers. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we think the how to build your security organization team. And uh, there are many good documents uh, already available, uh, textbooks, guidelines, and the frameworks. And uh, in Japan and uh, English or Japanese, uh, the documents uh, that have a good reputation. And there's a list. Uh, thank you for the good documentation. But uh, people in company or organization think uh, that is feel very difficult. Why? Uh, security organization team has various design and structures and the situations vary, uh, vary uh, like uh, scale, structures, and the staff, and the budget. And uh, uh, already they have uh, the existing services and the professionals. And uh, what is the organization aiming for the, uh, in the future? Mm. What should we do? And our working group six and our rock working group uh, classify and organize them from the viewpoint of the operators. Uh, break down the security operation into the services, services. And uh, after that, uh, summarize the using the categories and the services. Uh, at last, we published a textbook for the security response organization. That is just document. And here is our working group uh, public, public session documents. And uh, 2015 to the uh, this year. There are two big, uh, two big, uh, two important uh, document. And uh, at the uh, one is the uh, 2020, uh, 20, 20, mm? uh, 2018, uh, textbook for the security response organization version for 2.1. And uh, this year, uh, version three. Uh, anyway, at first, there is the information sharing. Now, in each working group, uh, everyone shared information with each other uh, only in this community, only in this community. Uh, we discussed the what is SOC, what is the vulnerability, vulnerability testing, what is the blah, blah, blah. At last, we released some documents. And uh, our textbook in the uh, 20, uh, 2018, uh, that was uh, referenced. One big point, uh, the special issue, the technology and the innovation in the Olympic Paralympic Games Tokyo uh, 2020. And here the uh, English word papers, and uh, you can download free. And next is the, uh, our context to uh, contribute to the uh, ITUT recommendation X.1060. And that is the framework for the creation and operation for the Cyber Defense Center. And next, the textbook uh, for the uh, response organization, the version three. Uh, here is the, uh, uh, this year's uh, February 13th uh, published. And uh, that document is aligned uh, with the uh, version 2.1 to uh, X.1060 uh, and only so, so uh, sorry, only Japanese. And uh, here is the writers and uh, thank you for the working group members and uh, thank you for the companies. And uh, here is the ITUT recommendation X.1060. Uh, X.1060 is the approved at the, uh, 2021 and uh, at first published in English and now published uh, uh, six languages. And uh, here is the related person in Japan. And uh, Hiroshi Takechi, the founder and the director of the ISOGJ, and uh, Shinji Abe and I are uh, also the uh, vice director of ISOGJ. 
And uh, here is the uh, site at the uh, ITUTS D70. Uh, if you need some information up, uh, or upcoming event, please check here. And here is the uh, outline of the X.1060, but today is a few, <laughs> few times. Yeah, uh, that is a figure one. And, and that is a CDC in the organization. And here is the, uh, now we can read the, uh, we can download from uh, ITUT in the English, Russian, uh, French, Arabic, Spanish, Chinese. And uh, if if you want to read, uh, if you read, uh, you, you'd like to read in Japanese, uh, here is a TTC standard. A TTC standard is a standard in Japan. And you can download the uh, JTX 1060 and uh, using in, uh, reading in Japan, uh, in Japanese. And now, uh, under development as a supplement for the X.1060, the center, that is a, a tutorial materials. And this document is for using X.1060. And uh, I'm also editor of the supplement of the CDC. Hmm. Okay, go back to the momoi -san. And last, uh, communication and collaboration. Uh, as Takei-san just talked, a uh, well-established document is the output of collaborating collaboration among many experts. Uh, repeatedly, uh, repeatedly talking in, uh, taking in and thinking about the viewpoint and ideas obtained from the documents. Um, it should help improve the team. Uh, when we released the document from ISOMJ, uh, we also met and discussed with many community members in Japan. And we, we gained the new insights from the discussion, then we update the document. Uh, having a community that is interested in what we have created, and being able to communicate with them is an asset in, in itself. Okay, that, that's all, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and I think that's all that we have for today, all the sessions. Let me see, do we have time for question? Maybe we don't have time for question to prepare for the other for mm -hmm. the for the other um, upcoming session next. Yeah. So let's uh, give them another round of applause. Thank you for the okay, presentation. Yeah. And please uh, have a look at their website with lots of really useful documentation uh, from the work of uh, the members. So with that, everybody, we have reached at the end of the session, and okay. maybe just uh, a few points before we all go. Um, uh, so first of all, thank you all speakers, all presenters, uh, all of the audience here and online, as well as HKIX for sponsoring the session. And I hope that you have seen the, um, the main theme for this session is collaboration, awareness, and uh, the, the work that has been done by various groups so we can all leverage and benefit from one another. And also... I think um, everybody here has a responsibility to contribute and help. And with that, uh, thank you so much for your attendance and participation. And I hope to see you at perhaps the next security track in another conference. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everybody. Yeah.